Right, welcome everybody to um, to this workshop um, brought to you by Oops. Microscopy Australia um, in conjunction with uh, the Volume Imaging Australia um, Special Interest Group. Um, with me uh, here today is um, Juan Nunez Iglesias, um, who is a Senior Research Fellow at the Monash E Research Centre. Uh, Juan's been uh, working on image analysis tools and techniques since 2009. Um, after attending the SciPy uh, 2012 conference, he's become an active collaborator in the scientific Python ecosystem and has joined the team for the SciKit image analysis library, co-authored the book Elegant SciPy, um, and has taught numerous scientific Python summer schools and created widely used um, libraries such as Scan and Napari, which we're all here to uh, use, which is a fantastic software. Um, and since 2018, he has been supported by a Chan Zuckerberg Imaging Software Fellowship to continue to develop the image analysis software ecosystem in Python. So without further ado, I will turn you over to Juan, um, who will teach us all about Napari. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Napari, which is um, a multi-dimensional viewer in Python. Um, so actually, I will do the, the takeaway slide. Um, so Napari is free. It's open source. Uh, it's fast. I'm going to put that in. I should start putting that in quotes because people keep challenging us with bigger and bigger images, and then it's no longer fast. Uh, but it's faster than what was around <laughs> when we made it. Um, uh, and multi-dimensional, and I think Napari's big idea is really like it doesn't care whether it's a two D image, three D image, four D image, five D image, whatever you want. Um, and so people do do really fun things with that. Um, it's written in Python, uh, and it works best within Python. Um, so um, yeah, I think of some of the messaging um, for a couple of years, I think you know people got caught up in the excitement and. Um, People without Python experience try to use it, and it can be frustrating because it's still like a growing, evolving, you know, beta ecosystem, and so um, you can run into errors. And if you're a Python user, then you can recover quite well. If you're not a Python user, uh, yeah, it can just be frustrating. But if you have a Python user next to you, then you can just bug them. Um, yeah, it lets you look at images. Um, so. Um, I think the most useful has been, at least for me, has been in, in quickly exploring your data and, and sort of understanding what's going on. Um, it lets you annotate them. So you can make segmentations and edit segmentations. Um, you can also add point annotations, polygons, and things like that. Uh, and then there's a big array of, eco of uh, plugins, um, over 400 now, um, that help you do various things uh, in analysis and annotation. Uh, and Napari um, was started by Loic Coyier and myself uh, a long time ago, but now it is truly a global project. Um, and um, there's over 170 contributors. Uh, and I sort of just keep an eye on things. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're very friendly and they're all over the world. So we do have like support basically at every hour of the night because if it's midnight here, it's sort of you know, daytime in the US and we've got a few folks in the US and in Europe. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, uh, using Napari just to look at your images. As I said, it, it can actually be really good for um, something like doing a quick look. Um, it's For me, it's like a little bit nicer than PG when it comes to like exploring 3D data. Um, Overlaying derived data, so how to look at um, both your images and things like segmentations, point annotations, how to manually annotate that data, um, then a few tricks you can do to work with big-ish data, um, then uh, how to how it integrates with other scientific Python packages such as PyTorch and Matplotlib. I think PyTorch is kind of like one of the big things why people use Python. Uh, look at some plugins. Uh, there's going to be a bit of time where we try together some of the annotation uh, plugins that are out there that uh, I wanted to spend more time playing before this talk, but I haven't. Um, but um, I've played a little bit, and we can sort of uh, have a look at them together. And then finally, I'll tell you about the community and how to get help and get involved. Um, again, this is now a global effort, and uh, it's it's pretty good time to pop in and if it's not doing exactly what you want, um, see if you can um, help us make it better for you. Um, okay, so now we go to the live demos. Uh, 
which could go very well or very poorly, as everyone knows. OK, so I think everyone can see my screen. Uh, and there's a Jupyter notebook. Um, so the first thing I'm doing is I'm reading uh, kind of a biggish 2D image. Um, so this is 10,000 by 10,000, so uh, 100 megapixel image. Uh, so it's quite big. And typically, if you're a Python user, you would this is what you would do with, the, with any image. You would do plt.im show, and you would show the image. And this is fine. Um, but if you want to do any kind of interactivity, it's kind of a little bit slow and clunky. Like it's not really, it's a plotting library that can display images rather than an image visualization library. Um, so everything is just a little bit uh, not ergonomic for, for looking at images. Uh, instead, if you do napari.im show, um, that makes a viewer and a layer for you. And we'll talk about layers in a bit. Um, and places it in. And now you can zoom in and out with the mouse um, and pan. Uh, and it's all very, very smooth because it's a single OpenGL texture that you're looking at. Um, the other thing, we recently added pinch to zoom. You can't see it, but you can you can use pinch gesture on your uh, Mac if you have that, uh, or you can just use scroll. Um, so that's that. Um, then if you have multi-dimensional data, such as a 3D volume, then map.lib is at this point useless. Uh, so this is uh, a data from the Allen uh, Institute for Cell Science, uh, AICS. Um, it's a very small subset, uh, but it'll do for our purposes. Um, and it's uh, 60 um, slice Z stack with two channels. Um, so again, if you try map.lib on this, it's going to tell you that your data is invalid. Um, because it's not traditional image data, it's scientific image data. Um, but if you use napari.im show, you can give it the array, um, which accesses the channel axis and a scale, um, and then it will. So what Napari does is for every dimension that your image has, uh, it will put a little slider here. Um, and so now I can sort of scroll through the, the whole array very easily. Um, and you can switch. There's a little switch button, which I'm sorry, the icon needs to be improved. But it's one of those things that we're like, we'll do that later. Um, but this this lets you toggle to 3D view. And then what it does is it removes one of the sliders, and now you can look at your data in 3D. Um, something that few people know is that you can right click on this as well and turn on perspective, um, which is nice. Uh, the one thing is. Not all of the 3D interactivity works in perspective mode, so this is only good if you want to look at data. If you want to click on things, then um, it doesn't all work uh, as expected. Um, that is something that we are working on. Um, so I'll go back to not perspective for now. Uh, orthogonal projection. Um, OK, so that's the basics, uh, how to use the party to look at images. Uh, now I'm going to talk a bit more about what this multidimensional and arbitrary dimensions means. Um, and I really like this example um, from Alistair Burt, uh, who's currently at Genentech. He was at uh, Cambridge when he did this. Um, so what he's done is he's done a PCA analysis of a whole bunch of particles from um, a cryo-ET data set. Um, so the idea is you look at, um, you you pick all of the particles in a cryo-ET volume, um, and then you um, align them all together. Um, and then you know each of those volumes um, has variance in one point or another. And then you, you use that variance to create a PCA of a 64 by 64 by 64 volume. Um, so what we're looking at here is not very easy to tell, but um, this is something else. So people added this to Napari without me even realizing. You can change the uh, order in which the dimensions appear. Um, so this is um, Z, Y, X. Mm. Um, so if you right click on this little transpose thing. Um, so I'm going to put Z in front. Uh, actually, I'll do that after. Um, so let me, let me just tell you what the dimensions are. So you can see that there's 2D in the canvas, and then there's three more dimensions. This is a five-dimensional volume. Um, this is just the third dimension, so the Z. Uh, we're scanning through the volume here. 
Uh, this is the uh, a bacterial protein sensor array at the, at the uh, cell wall. Um, then here is, uh, sorry, the zeroth axis is the principal components. So zero to 50, there's the 50th, uh, the 50 top components in the PCA. Um, and here is the position along that component. And so you can see, for example, in the first component, uh, we are looking at this wiggly motion of the particles along um, this rotational uh, vector. Uh, if you look at the second one, uh, let me do other contrast. Um, so I can go here and then I can see it's a you know still motion versus moving, I think is the is what this axis is. Uh, for other axes, you want to look at the transverse section. So I'm going to move this here. Uh, and let's go to, but this here you can really, you can see the membrane. Let me go back to the middle, in the middle. So you can see the, the membrane. Down here is the lipid bilayer and over here is the, the protein array. Um, I can make this bigger. Um, and if you go to the 11th component, so you can spend a lot of time exploring this data set. It's quite, it's quite cute. Um, so then if you move here, you can see that the curvature of the membrane changes over the over the axis of the of this particular PCA component. Um, so this is the sort of data set that I think would be quite tricky to explore uh, in any other software, but in Napari it's very natural. You just add dimensions and uh, it works as you as you would have. Um, and again, you can actually switch to 3D here, but um, and have a look at the um, protein array. Um, it does make some things harder to look at, actually. But uh, in some in some cases, um, it, it works really well. Um, okay. Um, any questions about that? Hopefully, some of you have some data that you couldn't look at before that now you're like, oh. Um, the next thing I want to talk is about is layers. Um, so in Napari, you can overlay. Um, you can not just look at images, but overlay things that are derived from those images. So I'm going to look at the, this example data set from Scikit Image. Just they're just a bunch of ancient coins. Um, and then I'm going to do a segmentation. Uh, so this is just from the Scikit Image gallery. Um, do a whole bunch of thresholding, um, clear bordering, and um, clearing the border and um, labeling. And then I add the labels, and so now you can see an overlay of um, these coins that have been segmented, um, and you can turn it on and off. Uh, you can change the colors. You can paint if you want, uh, although this is a pretty good segmentation, but I can erase this label and then I can paint it. Uh, I should probably um, pick the label first, but I don't, and then I can paint. All right. So you can not only look at segmentations, um, but you can also edit them um, as well. Uh, refine them. So it's actually really nice for uh, interactive. Oh, we'll get to that. Um, and then if I want to add uh, the centroids, I can uh, measure the properties and add points, point annotations to that as well. Um, so they're just some of the um, layer types. I'm going to look at it. Another one, which is the polygon layer. Um, so this is the cameraman image. Again, it's famous little example image from Psychic Image. Um, and then I can add detections from, say, a, a deep learning mo model like yellow and um, put annotations, text annotations on them. Um, so again, for exploring all of your data and your results, um, these kinds of overlays are really nice. Um, this is uh, another really nice example from Alistair about um, different layer types. Um, so he was using um, Napari to uh, find particles and again, cryo-electron tomography data set. Um, so here's the data. Um, 
for all the cryo-tea people in the audience, I have no understanding of how you see anything in this. Um, okay, so then you um, pick the spheres and you pick a um, sort of regular sampling along those spheres for um, um, particles, and then you refine that sampling. Uh, and Dynamo is a package that does this um, for you uh, outside of Napari. Um, and then the question you might have is like, well, did, did Dynamo do a good job and didn't find the particles in the right position and so on? Uh, and so you can load up your points. Um, and then that's what they look like. And if we switch to 3D view, you can see that you get this nice, uh, first of all, the points are not, they, they start in a rectangular grid and you can see that they have aligned themselves. If you zoom in here, uh, they align themselves to a hexagonal grid, which is what you expect for this particular um, HIV capsid protein. Um, so you see that the particle picking has basically worked. And the other thing that's missing is um, the orientation. And so Napari has a vectors layer. Uh, and again, you can use the vectors to see that all of the particles are correctly aligned uh, at, at, from, the, from the center of the um, sphere, um, which again, uh, it's just a nice way to very quickly verify that your algorithms are doing what you think they're doing. Uh, cool. And then you use those particles to align them and get a nice little structure. Um, and the other thing that I want to point to, and which I'll get into in the next example, is that all of the data that Napari uses is standard Python data types. So if I look at the points that we've just loaded, and I look at the dot data attribute, uh, it's just a NumPy array. And so if, you, if you're a bit comfortable with NumPy, then you can very easily sort of uh, introspect the, the data um, that NumPy is using, change it, uh, update it, that sort of thing. Or update it in Napari and then read it back and, and use it in your analyses. Um, so we'll go back to cells. Um, again, I started with a very easy segmentation, which is the coins. Um, the cells is easy up to a point. Um, and so we're going to do um, this algorithm that we've developed over many years of uh, segmentation tutorials uh, at SciPy. Um, so we've done, we found the nuclei, we found the borders of the nuclei. So that's what this is. Uh, and then we're going to do um, find the centroids and do a watershed. So fill in fill in the nuclei from the the center points of the nuclei. Um, so that's what these do. I'm not going to dwell too much on them. Um, and this is a labels layer here. Um, so now we've we see that we've done a pretty good job with the segmentation. Um, there's only two things. These, um, sorry. So we haven't actually done watershed. We've only done um, uh, connect components. So you can see that these nuclei merged, these nuclei merged, these nuclei merged. And this sort of uh, mitotic cell is merged. Um, so now the idea is we're going to try to find the centroids of these blobs and then do a watershed to separate the, the blobs. Um, so that's what you sort of get with your standard um, point detections. Um, and you can see that it's done a pretty good job, but it's missing one here. Um, and it's missing these two. Um, so if we want to, um, you can spend a very long time fiddling with parameters here, or you can spend very little time by just annotating these three points uh, and then um, continuing with your analysis. So what we're going to do is we've got the points. Uh, I'm going to go back to 2D. Uh, I'm going to make sure I'm looking at the right cells um, that are missing points. And they are this one, this one, and that one. Um, so then I go to points add mode, uh, and I'm going to add a point. I'm going to add a point, and I'm going to add a point. OK, uh, so now we see that we have points in every nucleus. Uh, and so we can use those points to see the watershed and separate them off. Um, so here you can see these are the automated points that we found. They're all integers. Uh, then when we added some points, they're in an integer plane, but they're in 
floating point coordinate wherever we added them. So these are the three three points that we've added, and we you can see that we you can just grab them from the layer data. Um, and now we are doing the watershed, and we see that we've separated these nuclei. Uh, we fill these in, and these are separated, but not perfectly. And this one is not separated. What's happened, uh, and this can happen very commonly with a watershed, uh, is, uh, yeah, if you look in here, this is one label. So if you focus on here, you can see that there's a label. So there's 17 now, and this is 16. So this one's sort of gotten enveloped by the by the 17 label because this nucleus sort of had had boundaries within it. Um, so what can we do? Um, so Napari actually has some pretty nice 3D interactivity. Um, it's not as nice as I would like it to be, but uh, it's something that we're actively working on. Um, so you can actually separate these two uh, bodies by turning on the eraser, saying that you want to edit in 3D here. Um, and then maybe making this a little bit smaller. Um, and then it's kind of, for those of you that have played Minecraft, it's like chipping away at things in Minecraft. Okay, so it's sort of plowing through. I'm holding down the, the mouse button uh, and I'm, I'm sort of milling here. So now you can see that there's not any connection between those two parts. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here actually. Okay, so I've disconnected these things. Now I can I use know, how deep is your little the eraser. So uh, if you do one click, it does a little sphere of whatever radius uh, your cursor is. Mm -hmm. um, and if you hold it down, you're sort of going through the the whole thing by that that depth. Um, so can you do that with like um, other uh, label numbers or just the zero erase? Uh, so the, the thing with the label numbers, and that's something that we will talk about a bit later that I, I don't have as much experience. So Napari 3D is, if you click in, in midair, it doesn't know where it's going to put it, right? Mm. Um, but with other label numbers, you can you can put little warts on things. So I can try that actually. I'm going to, and there is an undo, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to paint the thing. Hopefully everything's going to work. So that will only add things and the erase. It will, it will add things on top of things, right? So yeah. there's a little wart. Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, you do you, you do, and you don't have the preserve labels button checked, so that's just default behavior that it will preserve it in three. Um, preserve labels um, means that if I paint on a thing, it's not so. So here it's going to add a sphere at that intersection point, including eating into the this other oh, cell. It is. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. And if I clicked preserve labels, it wouldn't. It would just it be on the ward on top. Okay, yeah. Um, but so the, the other thing is so Napari 3D and basically a few other plugins will let you define what your depth is and then you can sort of paint in space. Um, um I'm, I'm going to show that now. Actually, how cause... do you do that without also changing like the width? Um, what do you mean by changing the width? Uh, well, right now you have a spherical paintbrush, mm. so you can paint deeper if you make the brush bigger, but it also is much wider. Um, oh yeah, you, so you can either do 2D or you can do, I like, sorry, this is the little video. It's kind of funny. <laughs> so yeah, you're painting. So it, it is spherical. It's always spherical. Is that what you meant? Yeah, I often like want to try and make a fine line, but it goes like a certain depth and yeah, so I mean, you could you, that erase. Yeah, you can either make it a two D only painting, so that yeah, sort of that is works. Really slow. Yeah, yeah. So then, uh, so are you saying you would like an anisotropic brush? Um. Yeah. Like I guess the um. Kind of laser like cutter, like you were doing with the erase tool, is useful. Um, Mm. But so often, you... I guess I want to do that with like a different label 
Well, the thing is that the That's laser, the, the laser doesn't, it looks like it has infinite depth because I'm sort of milling through it, but yeah. um, it doesn't have inf infinite depth either. So it it's still, it's always a little sphere. Um, that's the nice, that's sort of the mental model you want. Um, oh, okay. And so you have to just keep. Yeah, you have to sort of keep going. milling at it until it disappears. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, mm. there probably should be a laser mode, um, high power laser mode. Mm -hmm. um but yeah right now it's it's just the sphere was the is well most consistent thing to implement because then it's it is a sphere in every situation um which is less surprising than it's a sphere sometimes and a laser other time um yeah anyway this is this is um sort of deeply on our roadmap because um uh, one of the things i i sort of haven't talked about but i think everyone here has noticed is like we've got all these machine learning tools and it's supposed to be doing everything automatic but actually they're very data hungry and so people are doing annotation more than ever i think um and so improving the 3d volume annotation is like a thing that we really um uh, yeah really want to do um because i think it'd be very high value for for a lot of volume volume imaging um okay let me finish this little paint job um so you can pick colors so you can see if i i've got this little color picker and if i click on a particular cell it's going to pick that color so i'm going to pick this one and then i'm going to go to the fill bucket and then i'm going to click on that and that's done uh and then over here uh, i do need since i need the label inside i need, need to switch to 2d uh, pick, click on that. Is that 17? Yeah, okay. Click on that. Uh, and then I go back to 3D view and I fill and I fill that. And there you go. So now, if I'm not mistaken, we have our complete segmentation of our volume. So again, like the idea here is like you, you've used your algorithms, but then you've used interactivity to refine the output of the algorithms. Um, and I think that's quite a little powerful little combo um, that Napari can enable. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions on that? That's sort of the most of the thing on Napari interactivity. Um, so the next thing uh, on the little roadmap I made was um, big data. Um, so Napari, um, it depends on the bigness of your data, whether it's doing well or not. So if you have a really big 2D image um, and you have a multi-scale pyramid, um, that works really well. Um, if you have a big 3D sorry, if you have a moderate size 3D volume with a lot of time points, um, then that also works really well. So you can look at Napari will, using um, tools like Czar, uh, Napari will load the data lazily. So uh, here I am, this is a 213 gigabyte um, time series um, from the cell tracking challenge. Um, and so it's got, um, basically a two gigabyte uh, volume for each time point and it's got 60 time points. Um, so yeah, more than two gigabytes. Um, but it's chunked. And so what that means is that whenever we load a time point, we, we only need to load the chunks that belong to that time point. Um, and in this case, it will only load um, the 3D image data and it won't need to load the full uh, data set. So I can just do viewer.im show. Uh, this is a bit of a bug. Um, and then I can move around Z and it's only loading the chunks um, that are um, that are being displayed. Um, so I can also move a long time and you can see it's pretty quick. Now, if I switch to 3D, uh, it's gonna take a while because now it's loading a full two gigabytes uh, and it's also like not super responsive here um, but it's it's usable 
uh, and you can change. Uh, I really like attenuated mid for three D volumes because they give you a uh, better, you know, sense of three D compared to just the maximum intensity projection. Um, and then if I click a new time point, it's going to take a little while because again, it's loading two gigs from disk, um, but it's not too bad. Um, so um, the next step that you want to do though is if you want to have this all be responsive, then you do a multi-scale pyramid. Um, so here I've only loaded the raw chunks. Um, with Napari, you can feed it um, a sequence of arrays that are decreasing in size, and it will interpret that as a multi-scale pyramid. Uh, and then it will only load the scale that you're looking at in 2D. In 3D, it only ever loads the lowest resolution scale. But um, that's something, again, that we uh, have some work in progress to fix. Um, ideally, what you actually want to do is you want to load the level of detail that is a high level of detail close to the camera and a low level of detail far to, from the camera. So that's something that we're working on. Um, one thing that I do want to show is if you're a Jupyter Notebook user, um, the Napari API is um, responsive. Um, so, and, and bi-directional. So if I take the contrast limits here and I adjust them, uh, so I'm gonna make it a little bit brighter, for example, um, I can go over here and I can read them. So these are the contrast limits I just set. Um, and I can also set them and then they will get updated instantly in the viewer. Um, so I think that's a really nice um, feature of um, Napari if you're a Python user is this kind of going back and forth between the viewer and like interacting with your code. I just set the color map in the in the Jupyter notebook and it changed in the viewer. Um, and again, so and you can see that it's changed correctly. Um, so I was just talking about multi-scale. So I'm going to close this one and do this other thing as well. Um, so now instead of opening, uh, I've just opened the zero here before. Uh, I've, I'm opening the first resolution level, the second resolution level. Uh -huh. I'm going to rerun everything up to here. I don't know if to select this at all. Oh, it's going to launch a whole bunch of networks. All right. Oh, and of course, there's a cell with an issue, so let's stop that one. Um, well, I'll just import things as I need them down here. Okay. Um, the last thing that I want to show in the big data type of theme uh, is that Zar um, supports writing as well, and Napari supports writing into Zar. Um, so. Uh, image is the wrong thing here. Let me just reload that again. So I've got my image, uh, and then I'm going to use ZAR um, to open a new ZAR array. So this is the file name of this D type, um, particular same shape as my image, uh, and the chunks as uh, the same chunks as the image. Um, Okay, so now I've got this um, viewer. Do I not add labels? Okay, right. Um, so this is that folder where my data set is. So uh, I've opened omi1.zar. You can see that I've made a 01 labels.zar in that same directory. Um, and if I look into it, there's nothing there except for a .z array uh, attribute. Um, but you can see that it is an array of the same shape as the image. Uh, so 60 time points and the two gig volumes. Uh, now I can add the labels to the viewer. Uh, and you can see that I now have a labels layer. Uh, and I'm going to paint again in 3D. Uh, obviously, you would never hand paint this entire embryo, but I'm going to pretend that it's a reasonable thing. So increasing the brush size, maybe a little bit more. OK, so I've painted one nucleus, and then I think my label. Let's do another label, other nucleus. 
Um, so I've got two little paint spots. They're 3D because I turned on 3D painting. Um, and if I look into that array again, um, now I see that it's actually painted uh, a chunk of data into disk. Um, so it's kind of nice because it's painting as we're, we're doing it, it's painting to disk. So there's no like data loss or anything. And this doesn't work with anything else in Napari, so don't try it. I actually know someone who spent like an hour adding points to cells and then it crashed. Um, so in this case with Zara, you would lose nothing, uh, which is really nice. Uh, so hopefully we'll add that two points uh, in the not too far future. Um, Okay, the other thing, uh, this is like a very quick demo. I'm not even going to look at the code, um, but just to show that you can use Napari in conjunction with uh, things like PyTorch and Map.lib. Um, and, uh, you know, we work quite hard to to be uh, team players in, in Scientific Python. Um, and so this is a little example of a image denoising network. Um, and we're going to sort of be training it live and showing the, the loss function and the output of the network as um, it's running, if it decides to run. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is, this is uh, just the noisy, uh, it's called MNIST. It's a, it's a famous sort of digits data set. And you can see these digits are like really noisy. And we've got this denoising network that's sort of trying to figure out what's going on with it. And you can see the loss of the network as, it's, as the network is training. Um, and you can look at your whole data set um, again, it's doing all this lazily, so loading it on demand. Um, and as your um, model is training, you can see the output and you can um, see if it's doing a good job, if, if you maybe want to try to change some parameters and, and retrain. In this case, it's doing pretty well, actually. Um, I have not yet extended. This was like a quick demo that I put up for another talk and then uh, I have not yet made it into a really nice plugin for for you know real networks, but um, it shouldn't be too bad actually. Uh, hopefully, if someone someone's interested in driving that, I would I would help them a lot. Um, okay. Um, the final thing that I want to talk about um, is the plugin ecosystem. That's something that's been just really amazing to see how many people have uh, written plugins. Um, so there's, um, you saw before that we um, opened a multi-scale image by, well, you didn't see it and hopefully I'm not gonna crush my kernel again, but it, I just might. Um, so um, you can you can manually open these volumes that are decreasing resolution and add them to Napari or you can use the SOME ZAR plugin, which will do this in the background for you. It, it basically declares if you if you give me a file of type ZAR, I'm going to see if it's an OME ZAR. And if it is, I'm going to open it for you in the correct way, which includes the multi scales data. Uh, so now I use viewer.open uh, with uh, OME ZAR. And oh, hang on, I don't have a viewer. Well, it did open it. It just gave me a whole bunch of weird things, which I don't understand. I think it's the czar version uh, that happens later. But anyway, it worked. So now it's opened it. It's a multi-scale data set. And if I do 3D, um, you can see that it's now much faster because it's a lower lower resolution uh, scale. So again, if you save your data in a in a nice format like OMI czar, I highly recommend looking into it, um, then um, exploring your data with Napari is really nice and smooth. There's, you know, just to show the breadth of things, if someone wrote a Napari PDF viewer, so you can actually open PDFs in Napari and read them like that if you were so inclined, which you probably should not be. Um, but still, it just shows like, just plugins for all kinds of things, which is really nice. And actually, I think uh, the the use case that people talked about is like getting actual measurements out of figures and papers, uh, which I think is kind of cool. So you could you could find a figure. I don't think this is the right paper for it. Um, you could find a figure and try to figure out the scale of a thing by adding a shapes layer, 
making a path. Um, oops, I know how to make paths in Napari, which apparently I do not. Is it my edge width? Or is it my face? Anyway, you get the idea, I hope. Um, and I'm going to skip this particular segment. Um, so now we, um, if there's no more questions. Um, I'm going to try to show you this uh, Napar MIDI app controller, which uh, is something I'm really excited about. Um, it's a little project that um, someone did a little prototype on the internet, then I made it into a plugin. Then um, Gregorz um, Bokota, who is um, a PhD student and a party core developer in Poland, um, basically made a little undergraduate project uh, and, and these undergrads that he um, supervised um, just made this really, really nice version of it. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing screen uh, and instead I'm going to change my video to this thing. Thing. So you should be able to see my desk. Uh, and let me just turn off my mirroring video, video settings. Okay, so now I can see what you're seeing uh, in a sensible way. So I read my keyboard. Look at this. Okay, so this is here is the MIDI controller. Um, and it's for controlling music, um, but you can actually connect to it with Python. Um, so I'll put that here. And then, oh, I need my displays as well for, uh, come in, come on, let's not be settings. Okay, I'm gonna extend to one's iPad. I'm going to arrange. Yep, done. OK, so now here's the iPad. So this is this is this little um, workflow that I think if you're going to spend like a day annotating your data, um, this is a really nice setup minus a stupid cable. All right. And people see that more or less. Yes. OK, and now I'm going to launch Napari, which I should have done earlier. Uh, I'll do that up here. Okay. Okay. So now I move Napari to this thing. And I can do file, open sample. Oh, that's not a thing. And I'll do the cells 3D just because I like it. Okay, so everyone can see the cells. Um, and I can also do preferences. No, that's not what I want. I want plugins, uh, mini controller status and settings. Oh no, I see an error. Why is there an error? Uh, the wrong pedantic version. No, it's unhappy. I'm sorry. It looks like I cannot show the MIDI controller. Um, all right. Well, the last thing I will show then before going back to the presentation is, uh, again, sorry. Um, file open sample. Um, cells. Um, so we talked about painting a few times. Yeah, you can paint with uh, labels. Um, so that is, uh, again, a thing that works quite well uh, with an iPad. Um, so uh, again, it's a very nice way to um, have a painting session that is uh, not wanting, you know, suicide inducing. Um, the other thing that you can do is do, um, if you have a very large image, um, then painting into labels can be very slow. Um, 
So for for big multi scale like tissue tissue scale images, you want to draw shapes which are polygons. Uh, and there's a lasso tool uh, which was contributed by um, Walter Michael Bierdag, who's a PhD student at EMBO. Um, and you can just sort of draw cells really quickly. Um, and if the MIDI controller was working, you would use the controller to switch between slices. Now we have to do this like, and then um, draw some more, draw some more polygons basically. Um, okay, so um, this is mainly to show that there are plugins uh, even for using Napari in sort of non-conventional computing environments, which I think can be very nice. Um, so yeah, here's here's one of that workflow again about um, annotating. These are very large tissue samples. Um, so again, Napari can show big 2D multi-scale images quite well, uh, and polygons scale, you know, with whatever um, size. So it's you, you don't have to worry about painting into you know 15 megapixels. You're just painting a polygon, which is the same kind of scale-free. Um, this is one of my favorite plugins from uh, Robert Haas's group. Uh, in Germany. Um, so what they've done is they've computed the region properties of all of these cells um, and then plotted them as a UMAP. Um, well, done a UMAP reduction and, and plotted them. And you can see how selecting different parts of the UMAP will select cells with different properties. Um, I think it's a really nice sort of, yeah, way to subset your cells basically and, and do different analyses on them. Um, um, speaking again about the 3D annotation example, so this is a really cool um, example um, for annotating filaments. So if you if you draw a line in in a 3D view, you're actually um, creating a surface because um, you don't know sort of how deep the line should go. Um, but by rotating that surface, you can then uh, intersect another surface and get a line. So to annotate these filaments in 3D, you can um, draw two lines per filament and then get your full annotation in three dimensions, um, which is yeah super nice. Um, so if you have filament like data, that's that's a really nice approach. This is uh, again from Alistair um, before he was at Genentech. So uh, this is called um, the Pari Subboxer, and it's a way to pick particles manually uh, in three dimensions and orient them in three dimensions. So this was a, a particle that they couldn't get any of the automated algorithms to um, select correctly. And he sort of very quickly found, um, well, I think it's a putative new protein that they found um, by, by doing these alignments uh, at the cap of these microtubules. Um, yeah, and this is uh, Napari Subboxer. This one I couldn't have shown you because there's actually no uh, M1 macOS um, Python wheels, so it, it's very hard to install on a Mac. If you have Windows or uh, Linux, then this is a really nice um, plugin to quickly annotate 3D volumes. So um, you can uh, do something called shape interpolation um, with this volume, as well as um, seeing the full orthogonal projection uh, in 3D. So you can see here, um, David is um, annotating just a few slices that you can see in the 3D view. And then once he's done those slices, then he will hit an interpolate button uh, soon. <laughs> yeah. And uh, with a bunch of methods, that fills in the full label. Um, so now if you go to 3D, you can see the full 3D label annotated. Um, so yeah, really nice way to do 3D annotations. Um, rather than um, yeah, having to do every single slice. Um, OK, and with that, this is my credit slide. Uh, as I said, Napari is developed now with the help of hundreds of people. But uh, out of those, um, quite a few have sort of, sort of stayed uh, a bit longer with the project. Um, there are core developers. So Genevieve, who's on the call, uh, is a core dev, Draga, uh, currently my PhD student, um, though she wasn't my PhD student when she became a core dev, um, and Lucy um, on the bottom right. Um, then you've got the European cohort. Um, so Kevin Yamachi, um, he's the hiker dude. Um, he's part of the, um, yeah, he did a lot of the 3D in, in 
3D interactivity stuff. Um, and actually, I just realized I'm not going to have time to name everyone. But uh, just to show that it's a really a, a global cooperative project. Um, and um, if you want to learn more, get involved. Um, we are uh, on, uh, hopefully not Twitter, come to Mastodon. It's really nice. Um, and we do have a real-time chat that you can find uh, people um, yeah, at all hours of the night or during the day um, to get help with your Nepari usage. Uh, and we do have open meetings as well. So you're welcome. If you if you have a cool demo with Nepari or you want some help, you're welcome to come to those. Uh, and that's the, the calendar link. Uh, and the final thing I do want to say is we are actually looking for sponsors. Um, Nepari, like a lot of the yeah, a lot of this work takes a lot of effort uh, and it's hard to sustain effort without sustained funding. Um, and Napari has some funding, but um, not enough to sort of keep up with, with the demand for, for new features. Um, so if you know of anyone who might want to sponsor us uh, or who could, we are actually looking for, um, yeah, different ways to raise money. So things like uh, paid workshops and things like that. Uh, and if you know anyone who can contribute to that, then please get them in touch with us. And that's everything.